Hi everyone, welcome to the second day of Avant Museology at the Walker. Um, just briefly to say before before Anton uh, presents his film, um, this is I think this this film is it's very important. It's a very important kind of correlative to to Arseny Jelayev's not only his lecture yesterday but the book in general. And so, if for those who were who who had the the, the good fortune of being here yesterday, I think this is these are these are two very important kind of. Um, foundations of, of, of this conference, right? So thinking about immortality and thinking about the, there was a very interesting, uh, uh, there was a very interesting question from the audience about, about the Russian character yesterday. I think this is a, this is a kind of terrifying, a terrifying question to think about in, in this film, but then also with, uh, also in relation to the question of avant-garde museology in general. Um, this is, so it's my pleasure to introduce Anton Vidokla. Anton is an artist based in New York and Berlin. As a founder of Eflux, Vidokla has produced projects such as Do It, Utopia Station Poster Project, Pawn Shop, an image bank for everyday revolutionary life, the Martha Rossler Library, Time Bank, Eflux Video Rental, and United Nations Plaza. Uh, Vidokla is co-editor of Eflux Journal, along with Julieta Aranda, uh, uh, yours truly, and uh, Stephen Squibb. Let's give a warm welcome to Anton Vidokla. Good morning. Um, so just a few short words uh, about uh, the film that you're about to see. Uh, first of all, uh, it's slightly unfinished. It's st we're still working on it. Uh, it's like, let's say, 90% finished, but there are some technical issues and sometimes the subtitles are slightly difficult to read. So you're seeing uh, kind of like a rough cut, let's say. And um, the film is a part of a trilogy that will be uh, presented, that uh, is being developed for an exhibition in Berlin that will take place next September at the House of World Cultures. Um, and uh, basically the, the trilogy is based on s exploration of some of the ideas implicit in Russian cosmism, which uh, has been mentioned yesterday by Arseny, but also a little bit by Boris Groys. But uh, basically, it's a kind of a philosophical movement that was extremely influential on uh, many, many, many Russian artists, intellectuals, uh, scientists, uh, filmmakers, uh, uh, theater directors. Basically, uh, at, at the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century, until approximately uh, early 1930s, when uh, basically as a result of Stalinism, uh, it was completely suppressed. Uh, it became extremely dangerous to uh, publicly exhibit works or publish books on this particular topic. Uh, many people were uh, uh, sent to camps for belonging to this intellectual movement. Some were executed like uh, uh, Pavel Florensky, who was a kind of a very important writer, was, uh, yeah, was shot. So it basically, it kind of ended in early 1930s in a very brutal way. However, uh, some and then for many years, it it was kind of forgotten, yeah, uh, because none of these works uh, could circulate in Russia. Many of them were not really translated to other languages, although some have been translated to German and English in in the 1920s. Um, and uh, but already starting with the 70s, you see that some of the ideas implicit in cosmism start appearing in in the work of contemporary uh, filmmakers and writers. For example, uh, a lot of Tarkovsky's films literally quote verbatim sentences from Nikolai Fyodorov. Uh, who is basically the, the founder of the intellectual founder of this movement. Fedorov was a, a very unusual person. He was um, a kind of a son, an illegitimate son of a, uh, of a no nobleman. So he did receive quite decent education. He was able to study in the university, but he did not inherit any, inherit any of the wealth and was an extremely modest person. He worked most of his life, well, at first as a school teacher in elementary school and then as a librarian in Moscow. He donated uh, almost 90% of his paycheck to, uh, uh, to poor people, to charity. He lived in an extremely ascetic way, like there are rumors that basically his diet, his daily diet consisted of uh, simple bread and tea. And you would think that this is a terribly unnutritious diet, but he lived 
to the age of 87. So, you know, apparently it's not so bad. And when people kind of try to uh, support him a little bit and offer him at least uh, like a full meal, he would thank them profusely, but he wouldn't actually eat it. Yeah. So, um, but he was a very interesting thinker. He kind of slowly, gradually developed uh, this very unusual philosophy, uh, which is referred to as philosophy of a common task. And the common task, in his opinion, was that, um, okay, let me take a short step back, because like basically in the 19th century, one of the biggest crises is the, is the disappearance of God. Yeah, that for many, many, many centuries, thousands of years, uh, you know, there were two realms. There was the earthly realm of yeah, material living, and then there was a transcendental re realm, which was in constant economic connection, communication with the earthly realm. And the, 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 this intangible realm, this spiritual realm, was infinitely greater. Yeah? And then at a certain point in 19th century, you know, you, you witness this in philosophy and in many other fields, God just disappears as a kind of a instrumental force. Yeah? And then many, many thinkers basically uh, try to find a way to deal with this. And in a certain way, Fedorov is not so different from Nietzsche or many other philosophers of his time. He, they're basically dealing with this incredible trauma of the death of God. And like, for example, yesterday Valid Rad was quoting a notion of a Lebanese uh, writer, theorist, Jalal Tufik, this, uh, uh, the, the withdrawal of tradition past a surpassing disaster, and this kind of disappearance of God would probably be can be considered a sur surpassing disaster, disaster so great that you cannot quantify it in any material or even psychological terms. So, uh, but at the same time for Fedorov, even though he comes, he's extremely religious, he comes out of Orthodox Christianity, but he's also very much a person of his times. He is passionately involved with science and technology. He is an evolutionist, yeah, he really believes in evolution. And he kind of takes the notion of evolution to a certain kind of radical um, direction where he basically, he thinks that evolutionary speaking, we're incomplete because we're mortal, yeah? And that death is not a natural thing, but it's basically a flaw in our design. But since God is not there anymore, it's up to us to fix this problem. It's up to us to evolve further, to become immortal. And then the second part of his uh, idea is really ethical, that we cannot just become immortal for ourselves, as somebody like, for example, Peter Thiel, that, that Hitoshtal was referring to, with all of this kind of res resurgence of interest in immortality, prolongation of life, eternal youth by technological mean means. That is totally, that is a kind of a very selfish position that Fedorov would completely reject, because if immortality can only work if it's immortality for everybody. Everybody on this planet who are alive now, but also everybody who has done, who has come before us. For example, uh, one of the you know possible critiques of Marxism has been that, you know, as everybody on earth is kind of working towards a kind of a utopian society where there is no more alienation, where there is no more exploitation. It's only the generation that achieves communism would benefit by it. But all of the generation that basically struggled for it, that, that starved, that, that worked t towards it will not benefit by, by the arrival of communism yeah, or emergence of communism. Fedorov's ideas are quite different because basically this common task means finding a technological way to make humanity immortal, but then to go back and resurrect every single people, a person who ever lived on Earth, starting with Adam. And of course, uh, since he's a 19th century religious f uh, thinker, he does believe that everything started with Adam and so forth. And for him, museum is a particularly important place. Uh, you know, for him, it's maybe the most important, the most uh, promising kind of social form where this immortalization and resurrection will take place. The reason he thought so is that he kind of thought that museums are the only institution in society that are not dedicated to progress. And by progress, he meant erasure of the past by, by the future, by the next thing, yeah, which he's criticized as being capitalist in nature, yeah? So for him, museum is the only place in our human society that actually 
is completely committed to preservation of the past, to preservation of memory, to um, restoration of things. Yeah, And he thought that basically this activity needs to be radicalized so that we don't only preserve uh, stuffed animals or portraits of our ancestors, but we actually use the technology of restoration, of conservation, develop it further in such a way that we would be able to bring all of this living beings back to life. Uh, so uh, basically this film, the text, comes from an essay which is in this book, uh, in Arseni's book, which is called Museum, it's um, Meaning and Mission, and it's a selection of uh, passages from, from this essay. The essay itself is quite long. Um, and it was shot this winter in Feb in March in Moscow uh, at four museums: the uh, Tretyakov Gallery, the the, the contemporary uh, modern section of it that has this incredible collection of uh, Soviet and Russian avant-garde, uh, at the Moscow Zoological Museum, which is actually the oldest museum in Russia. It dates back to. Uh, end of, uh, uh, I think, 1794 it was founded. Uh, also, the Lenin Library, which is a kind of a very particular place and a, a museum of sorts, and uh, also the Museum of Revolution, which is called now the Museum of Russian History, which is something that Arseniy was referring to yesterday, which is a museum in transition. Um, and uh, the, the people that appear in the film uh, some of them are members of uh, Fedorov Library, which is a kind of a society of people who are interested in ideas of Fedorov that meet in a small children's library in, on the outskirts of Moscow to read and discuss his writings. Uh, and also there are two actors in the film. And there is also Arseniy, uh, who is one of the uh, participants. And there is a dog. But you'll see the rest of it. Uh, I think maybe now we should start. The introduction was a bit long. Thanks. Uh, OK. Uh, thank you. That was really incredible. Um, in the script, it was talking about the museum not being a place for revenge because it only talks about the life of an object. And I was wondering if you had any ideas of like a forum for revenge or like where that would take place. Oh, I think uh, in this is always very interesting with uh, ideas of Fedorov because usually when I do lectures about him or my films, people always ask, well, resurrecting everybody, does this like include Hitler and Stalin and I don't know, all of the monsters of history. And of course he meant, yes, everybody, absolutely everybody, because I think the interesting thing is the kind of social change and the kind of reorganization of, of human relations that will need to occur in order for a project of this magnitude to actually be materialized, you know, basically will probably make a figure, a divisive or a violent figure like a Caligula or a Hitler completely harmless, yeah, because first of all, everybody is immortal, yeah, nobody can die, you cannot kill anybody, right? The entire society on earth is dedicated to immortalization, resurrection, and all of that. So, all of this kind of um, discord, precisely what, what Fedor uh, writes about, uh, will not, so it will be safe to bring these particular individuals back into existence. So, I, there is no place for revenge, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, since yesterday, I've been wondering why Fedorov thought that immortality should be a goal, since God is dead and that sort of that's over. Why would immortality be something that he uh, aspired to, or he wanted to bring everyone back? Why? Uh, well, for many reasons. He basically, he, first of all, he felt that you know death is more of a, a flaw, a, a mistake, rather than a kind of a natural necessity. And actually, it's quite interesting, you know, I, I'm, of course, I'm not a scientist, but so my knowledge of this is basically from popular articles and things like that. But it seems at the beginning of life on this planet, the basic, the, there were two possibilities. One was basically a state of immortality where a cell would never die. Yeah. And then the other direction which evolution ultimately took is a cell would uh, reproduce, yeah, divide, but would die. And it would die precisely because, obviously, if all of these reproducing cells would not die, this planet could not sustain 
this amount of living matter, yeah, and uh, but but there were these two kind of trajectories, and you know, evolution is a very long range project and there's still a potential to go another direction. There are organisms on this planet that don't die. It's very strange, but uh, there is a particular kind of a jellyfish uh, that has been discovered about 25, 30 years ago that actually does not die naturally. You can kill it, yeah, you could burn it or whatever, but uh, left on its own, it, it just keeps re repeating cycles, yeah, so when it gets old, it reverts to youth and then it gets old again, and then it reverts to youth. Strangely enough, there is not a big curiosity about this uh, organism, and there is only one scientist who is actually doing research on it in Japan. You would think that everybody would be obsessed with this jellyfish, but I think death is a, a really kind of interesting thing, and a lot of our relationship to it is largely psychological. You know, and uh, again, a lot of times when I you know, do lectures or, or, you know, seminars on this, I noticed that particularly with young people, they're really afraid of eternity, yeah, because they imagine eternity as being like infinite suffering or infinite boredom or infinite pain or something like that. Yeah, but, uh, but that's not necessarily uh, how, you know, things can be. And, you know, personally, people always ask me, do I want to be immortal? I really don't know. But just knowing how long it takes to make a film, for example, you know, I would love to have 500 years to make a really good film, you know, and really re-edit it a million times and really make it absolutely perfect, you know. So I could do with a little bit extra time, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the other reasons why that Fedorov mentions is, of course, like he feels that death is very unproductive because it ends uh, conversation, it, it, it severs knowledge, yeah, that all of these people that are incredibly intelligent and incredibly brilliant or people very dear to us, the, the, the break in the relationship that happens when they pass away is something that is completely unproductive for humanity, yeah. So, uh, but of course, I highly recommend reading his books because he can, uh, he writes about it much more articulately than I can summarize right now. Um. I think Elizabeth has a question. Where did he think um, the substance of all of these resurrections would come from? Okay, but he was a kind of like, I think the idea uh, was partly based on his understanding of Aristotle. Aristotle felt that the matter, physical atoms that make up our bodies, objects in the world, you know, plant life, animal life, that each atom is imprinted with a kind of a, like almost like a, a like a code of the soul, yeah? So when, so you die and you kind of disintegrate and all of these atoms, they scatter and maybe they leave the atmosphere of this planet and maybe they drift somewhere in the universe. But if you were to somehow collect them and put them back together, the soul is imprinted on them, so the, 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 the personality, the character of this person would actually come back into being by recombining material remains, yeah? Uh, so so it's way, really, just a really, yeah. just a really practical question, because uh -huh. I, I know some of it yeah. from talking with you, but so he didn't think that there was a, so say death, decomposition, scattering into the universe, rearrangement into different form, decomposition scattering, but, right, so that there's in some sense a limited set of molecules or atoms that can be recombined into a bazillion ways, infinite ways, but each way depends on the decomposition of another way. That was not his way. You see what I'm saying? Cause it's yeah, just like, I kind of see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Boris touched on this very, very uh, slightly, maybe more in the Brooklyn part of this conference than, than here in Minneapolis. It, it seems like it has something to do with this kind of idea of radical materialism. Yeah, that 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 somehow, you know, if you that the soul is actually in the matter. Yeah, that. It's, yeah, and, and then if you could somehow find a technological way to bring the matter back together, it will bring that to which we refer to as the substance, as the soul, as the, you know, the essence of, uh, 
But uh, again, uh, not being a philosopher or scientist, I cannot clarify it for you much more. But it's worth reading Fedorov. It's really interesting. And yeah. So maybe one last question, and then we'll go to the next presentation. Um, just to, to, to kind of a little bit follow up on the idea of soul, and uh, there was mentioned, there was a couple of things mentioned in the film, the idea of a uh, true religion, and this constant reference to a temple, and certainly there's a precedent within um, spiritual history, religious history, uh, especially in Buddhism, of uh, immortality, I examples of reincarnation constantly, and the idea of soul as something that is not related necessarily to the bottom, not necessarily re to, the, to the body, not necessarily related to atoms. And is there any, like, what is the technology of that vis-a-vis -vis this art, artistic museum sort of structure? Yeah, um, well, you know, Fedorov, again, he's like a, a religious thinker. He's a religious philosopher, and, and he comes out, you know, directly from Orthodox Christianity, uh, and he really believes in God, you know. But at the same time, his writing is permeated with this also belief in materialism, technology, science, and that somehow it is up to us that, that you know, that, that, that w to which we refer to as soul somehow is residing in the matter. Yeah, and, and that if there was some kind of way to, through restoration, through conservation, through, uh, yeah, all of this kind of almost, let's say, museological techniques through preservation, that you're not actually preserving only the body, you're actually, I within, within that matter, there is that which, you know, is us. Uh, he was not, he was very well aware of Buddhism because actually it was quite popular in Russia in the 19th century. You know, of course, China and, and India, it's, that whole area is borders, bordered Russian Empire. So one of the biggest collections of, for example, Taoist manuscripts and a lot of Buddhist uh, scripts and writings were in the museums of the Russian Empire at the time, and a lot of intellectuals were reading them. It was kind of something quite fashionable. So he's, he is familiar with Buddhism and Taoism and you know all of these religions, but he kind of he rejects them. He thinks that this is kind of uh, that it produces kind of a misunderstanding, that it's false consciousness. That he doesn't believe in reincarnation, but he does believe in technological resurrection. Let's say. Um, so I think maybe uh, we should stop here because uh, we should move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah.